the Latin word, it's despair. And despair simply means without hope, or to lose hope, or to give up. Similar Latin word is the word despondency. Despondent. Literally, it means without promise. So similar, without hope, without, without confidence. I think those words unfortunately describe the days that we live in globally in our own country, and it has at different times more strongly than other through history. We think of the ongoing battles that we have with COVID. I think of the moral battles more so that we as evangelicals look at and if our hearts are sad, how much sadder is the heart of God for his created beings? We think of other just issues pressing our country, inflation, the transportation of goods, the the need to fill positions and jobs and how hard that is. My mind went to the horrid uh, tragedy just last last Sunday at that Christmas parade in Waukesha, Wisconsin. Six people died out of the 62 injured. Right, This vehicle plowed through a crowd of Christmas parade in Waukesha, so says this newspaper article. Over the weekend, turning an afternoon filled with holiday cheer into instant tragedy. Daryl Brooks, 39, breaks through that ongoing that parade high school band members included in local dance group, at least nine, mostly children in critical condition. We think, where is this all going? What do we do? How do we get through this? Do we give up? Do we have no assurance? Do we say this is crazy? There's no way out of this situation? And you and I, if we're committed followers of Jesus Christ, we have to know we have hope in Jesus Christ and what God's plan is. None of us know what a day holds. We don't know. The phone call that we get at 2 in the morning, nothing good. Are we going to be determined in our hearts to stand strong in our faith in Christ, to not despair, to not give up? The Apostle Paul wrote in in 2 Corinthians 4, He says, we're hard-pressed on every side, but what? Not crushed. Look at the words. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We need to remember that. And what's the key? Why is this true? It's the next verse. We always carry around in our bodies the death of Christ so that the life of of Jesus will also be revealed in our bodies that he is alive and we walk in him by faith as he is the risen Savior. That's how we have to live our lives every, every day with hope that we have in Christ no matter what's cooking and going around us. This one who has come, he's coming again and he dwells in us today by his Holy Spirit We are not without hope. We have to remember that. Those of this world and every generation, those who have not placed their faith in the Lord, what do they, what help do they have? But not so for you and me. In the face of the battles, we go through daily battles all the time. Decisions we have to make, struggles that we go through. But if we place our faith in Christ and know him as our Savior, we can live by faith in him. From our text this morning, Isaiah chapter 8 and 9, we we know the struggles of God's chosen people, Israel and Judah specifically, as they lived in disobedience, even with the promised hope, the Messiah is coming. We go to the beginning of time, Genesis chapter 3. And God promised that the offspring of Eve would crush Satan. Then you jump up to Genesis 12, and the the promise is given that the seed of Abraham, through his seed, the whole world would be blessed. What a promise. In Genesis 49, that that an offspring, right, this ruler is going to come out of Judah, and all the nations would, you get it, obey him. That's the promise. That's the hope. That day will come. In the course of time, 
as God revealed through his word more and more about this promise, the Son of God, the Messiah who would come. This morning, I want us to look at one key messianic passage in, in Isaiah. And Isaiah writes, with the despair of God's people, they were in a time of great despair. 700 years before the coming of Jesus Christ. But he writes about the hope that Israel, Judah specifically, can have, and the same hope that we can have in this Advent season, in this little mini-series that we're looking at. We see the hope that we have as Jesus has come, and we wait for his coming again. I want us to see that by living by faith in him, we do not live in despair. We can live in hope. Faith in him no matter what we face. If you've got your outline and it will be a help to you, you also need to open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 1 because we're going to walk through chapters 1 and 2 and 3 and 4, so do that. But the first point I want to make is there was one reason for despair. No clue? Yes, sin. Sin is the reason for despair. It causes all despair. Sin does. My sin does. But it's not necessarily my sin that causes despair either. It's not necessarily yours. We can face despair because of illness and disease. That came into the world through the fall of Adam. We live in a fallen and perfect world. Therefore, accidents happen. Lives end. Despair can come to your family, to my family, when we lose a job. And maybe it's my fault that we lo I lost my job. Maybe it's the fault of the misspending of a company. It may not be my fault at all. But it happens because of sin all the time. Sin in the heart of us humans for murders and killings and hatred and terrorism. And we must not fail to see the tentacles of sin, the ripple effects that sin has on all life, all society. Sin doesn't mean I caused it, doesn't mean you did, but our lives are affected. Sin, indeed, is the reason to despair. Life in Israel, we see the despair of God's people, again, 700 years before Christ's coming. Israel, God's chosen people. God gave them his word. He gave them the pointing, the, the law. God gave them judges, and he gave them prophets. And possessing all the blessings like no other nation only heightens the despair, does it not? And then my mind goes to the United States for the last 200 years, or England, or Scotland, or Germany, who had the word of God faithfully preached now for centuries there, and the way that the world, those countries, our countries have turned away from the preaching, and it ought to just heighten the gloom all the more. Great preachers that brought the word of God generations and generations and generations ago. Here in Isaiah, we see the despair of the people of God. The ministry of Isaiah was dealing with the sin of the southern kingdom, Judah, and their wicked king, Ahaz. We see six reasons for despair that he gives to us. Looking at them, reasons for despair, point A, living in sin when one knows better. That's chapter 1, right? Go there. Chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. God's people know how they ought to live, but God's people rebel. And the days were dark and despairing. Look at verses 7 and 8. We see the sin results in judgment, and God uses a foreign nation to invade his people. It's coming. Verse 9, look at it. Judah's sinless sinfulness is compared to the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. Yes, there's, there's despair when we choose to sin and when we know better. B, living in hypocrisy brings despair. Look at chapter 1, verse 13. We see Judah's hypocrisy in worship. Is it any different today? How many people worship some kind of sense of who God is? But their heart is disobedient. God doesn't want worship. He wants obedience. Verse 16, what does he want? He wants that, there it is, that righteous living. Point C, another reason for despair. Facing the day of the Lord, it will certainly be a despairing day. 
That's chapter 2, and, and Isaiah writes now about the coming day of the Lord, and as we studied Judah, Joel, rather, and as we know here, the coming day of the Lord brings a day of blessing for his people, but a day of great judgment for those in rebellion. Point D, facing the judgment of God can only bring despair. That's chapter 3 and 4. Point E, rebelling from the God who loves brings despair. That's chapter 5. Look at chapter 5, verse 1 in your Bibles. God shows his love for his people, but instead of his people producing a good crop, they produce only a, a bad crop. And so God will execute judgment. And that's the rest of the chapter. Chapter 6 is a break as Isaiah is commissioned to be a prophet of the Lord. Chapter 6, verse 5. Isaiah sees his unclean lips as he lives among a people of unclean lips. The reason for despair. That's reason in our society too. Then point F. Rejecting God's gift of himself brings despair. That's chapter 7. Isaiah. Chapter 7 through 12 is called the book of, of Emmanuel. Right there in the midst of Isaiah. Because it talks about the one who is God with us. Chapter 7, Isaiah addresses the deliverance of Judah. And it's from Syria and Israel, right? The two nations to Judah's north. In chapter 7, verse 2, we see that Judah was shaken and full of fear and despair. But verse 4, Isaiah tells the king that he doesn't need to fear. And I love those words, these two smoldering stumps of firewood. Because God will fight for his people. Awesome. However, Ahaz needed to believe and place his faith in that God. But instead, he makes an alliance with another nation up to their north and east. And that's the nation of Assyria. And so God tells Ahaz to ask for a sign. To show that he will, he will redeem them. Give them victory. Isn't that awesome? But sinful Ahaz wouldn't do it. In fact, he has the audacity to quote Scripture back to God. Verse 14, God gives him a sign anyway. Sounds familiar, right? The version will be with child and give birth to a son, and he will call him Emmanuel, meaning God with us. Good news, Ahaz. You don't have to fear these two little nations to your north. But the nation that you've allied yourself with, who you're going to team up with, that nation will destroy you, not rescue you. Because you've rebelled from me. That's what happens. That's going to happen, and it is happening. That's reason for despair. It's the rejection of God. And here God says that he would send Emmanuel, God with us, born of a virgin, a miraculous birth. The sign was immediately fulfilled as Ahaz's wife gave birth to a son and, and she wasn't a virgin and it was Hezekiah. And by the time Hezekiah reaches the age of accountability, knowing right from wrong, those two nations to the north were laid waste. This reference to Emmanuel is more than just this immediate statement, but it, it's worked through this whole section. And it is a miraculous birth. Hezekiah wasn't a miraculous birth, but he was that little beginning point of a sign that would ultimately be filled in the birth of the Christ to Mary, a virgin. What does God do? God offers himself, saying, trust me, believe me in your day of crisis. But failure will bring despair. Chapter 8. Again, we see judgment because of it, a Judah's rebellion. There's a call to God's people to follow him. He's the one we need to fear, not a human enemy, for he is the one who will protect us, not some alliance that we make for our protection. Some application. Verses 19 to 22, chapter 8. We have Isaiah's description of what is dark and gloomy when there is no faith in the true and living God. We look around our country. We can look to this world and see what life is like without a view to God. 
Isaiah wrote that there is nothing but utter darkness and despair without Emmanuel. And it doesn't matter what country we're in. Life outside the Messiah is hopeless. It doesn't matter if we're living in the wicked days of Ahaz or the first century of Greek Roman society or today. Outside of faith in that promised one who has come and is coming, it's just darkness, true hopelessness. It's because our hope can't be in the stuff of this world, the ways of this world, a government. God has sent light into this world and it's in the form of Jesus Christ. And he writes about that now in chapter 9 when the darkness and gloom will be removed with the coming of Messiah. There's our reason for hope in life, your reason and my reason, because the Messiah has come. We've, we just sung about that. Picture of Christmas, the birth of the Savior, the Deliverer, the Promised One, who is our source of hope. Well, there's one reason for despair, sin. There's one reason for, for hope, and that's the person of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so we see point A, why, why there is hope. In Isaiah 9, we see three reasons for hope. This is for all of us. There's hope, point one, because God sent light to dispel the darkness. Judah was facing very trying times because of their sin, and they were going to face judgment but with the coming of Messiah, Emmanuel, a great change takes place. That's the promise here. And point A, God removes the gloom. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. Isaiah refers to the northern part of Israel, the two most more northern tribes, Zebulun and Naphtali. And they were exposed to the Gentiles in that region because that's, they were mixed there. When someone was going to devastate and go into Israel, it was always from the north that they would come in and attack. And these two tribes make up Galilee. Galilee of the Gentiles is what it says. Isaiah gives us the two script descriptions of that territory, the two sides of the Jordan River. He wrote on the way or the road by the sea, and that's, that's on the western side of the Jordan River, and on the eastern side along the Jordan, right? East of it, both of it. The promise is that their gloom will be taken away. No longer will they be under the attack by those who oppose God. No longer will they be the doormat of the heathen. Good news. The Messiah, the Redeemer, has come. There's hope. Because point B, God removes darkness. Verse 2. What's the conditions? They're walking in darkness, meaning they're living in the land of the shadow of death. There's no hope. This wasn't spiritual. This wasn't physical darkness. This is spiritual darkness. Sin had control of their lives. That's darkness. That's our world. That's our society. Darkness. But in a time of great spiritual darkness, a great light will come. And that's referring to the Messiah. And he has come. John chapter 8, 1 Peter 2. It's only in Jesus that one is taken out of darkness and brought into the light, right? You know that. In contrast to darkness and death, John 1, John chapter 12, being in the light of Christ means the light of Christ has come to us, the life. Being in that light also means that sin gets exposed, and when it's exposed, it can be dealt with. And Jesus died for that sin. He's our hope. Jesus came to provide a way out of true darkness, that of sin. He was the payment for that sin. He is the way out. He's my way out. He's your way out. He's the way out for anyone who would believe, no matter what country they're in. There's, there's hope in this point, see, because there's hope, rather, because God brings joy. Look at that third verse. It's a description of joyous times, harvest time, that of a victory time. There was always great joy in that, in the Messiah, right? What will come with the Messiah, the nation, the people of God, he says, will be enlarged. 
Those who believed in the Messiah, the promised one, were very small in number. Hearts of most were turned away. But a time will come when the nation will enlarge. Here in Isaiah, referring to Israel, but it in no way excludes the Gentiles, we get to the birth narrative of Jesus, Luke chapter 2, and, and we read that familiar verse 10, and an angel declares to the shepherds, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. The hope of the world has come. There's hope point too because God will send. Look at verse 4. He brings freedom. We need that freedom. And he writes of the day of Midian. Well, that's a flashback. You know where you find that description? The book of Judges, chapter 7, when Gideon defeated the tribe of the, the, the people group of Midian, who wasn't just Midian, but other eastern nation against him. And, and remember, God says to Gideon, you have too many men. I cannot deliver Midian into their hands, or Israel would boast against me. My own strength has saved me. So he reduces his army down to how many? 300. <laughs> Against an enemy that's as thick as locusts. Who brought the victory? It obviously wasn't 300 men. It wasn't human strategy. A torch, a pitcher, a yell. It was God who brings the victory. And God promises victory. For you and me as we live by faith. It may be a spark of hope, but our hope is in Him. Victory from our Lord. The coming of the Messiah. No one will be able to oppose Him. Who is our true opposer? It's not a government, it's not a nation, it's Satan. The bottom line, it's sin that causes despair. We've got to remember that. It's not who's the president, who's the prime minister, what nation is inviting, invading what nation. That's not despair. Despair is no faith in the one who brings hope. Can we get that? Jesus promised, God promises freedom and liberty. No one else can do that. You've experienced that freedom that Jesus brought in your life. Live in it. No matter what's crunching down around us. He's that freedom within until that day when he comes and will reign on this earth. Why do we have hope? We get to that. Point three, because God will send peace. Look at verse five. And he describes the burning of a soldier's garment and war instruments, all destroyed when Christ comes. He is the prince of peace. He will bring out peace as a ruler. Christ's first coming brought internal peace, a spiritual kingdom of the heart where we are no longer at war with God. Peace reigns in our heart. We've been reconciled with God. Point B, we see the cause of hope. Verses 6 and 7. And point one is the Messiah himself. Let me read these words again. Verse 6, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of, the, of His greatness and government, of His government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over His kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. We're not there to that day yet. Not physically. The word Messiah is Hebrew. The word Christ, Christos, is Greek. Anointed one is the English translation. And he will bring and has brought redemption over Satan. We have that promise since the fall of man, the anointed one would then reign on David's throne forever. So what do we learn? His kingdom is known, or his coming is known. Isaiah uses the tense and sense that it's already happened. It's already, he's already come. And then he says, he's born, right? Is born. And, and, and so he's already come to earth. Well, if, he, if he's born, he must have parents. He's a real human being. He's going to have a body. And then secondly, he's given, right? He's given. The Messiah is given. It's a gift. God gives us a gift. What New Testament ideas come to your mind? John 3, 16. Ephesians 2, 8, 9. God's gift to us. We don't earn it. We don't, we, all we can do is receive it and take it. And Jesus comes. He's given, 
Judah didn't deserve redemption. We don't deserve redemption. But out of God's love and mercy for that nation as his people, for his people on this earth, all people, if they would turn their faith to him, God gives us his son. Three, for us. He's done for us. To us is born. To us is given. It's on our behalf that he sent his son to die on that cross. All about his grace. His grace for you and me. We have that promise in the birth narrative of Matthew chapter 1. Joseph, give him the name Yeshua. Yah, short for Yahweh. Shua saves. Yahweh saves. He will save his people from their sin. This, is go- this one's going to do something. He's going to die for us so that we can have hope no matter what we face. And Jesus brought deliverance from sin. We know that clearly in his first coming. Salvation. Delivered from the penalty of sin. We can have hope no matter the circumstances we face. We live by faith. Well, not only does, does God make his coming known, but point B, his nature is known. We have this great description of him, these names of God, God the Father and the Messiah, the one who has, will be coming, deliverer. And, and, and so his nature is described. He's called wonderful. It, it, there's pairing there. This is the first one, and it may not be paired with counselor. It might be wonderful counselor, but maybe more likely, uh, scholars would write that it doesn't seem that if, if, if Isaiah meant it to be coupled together, there'd been an easier way for him to express it. And I agree with those, uh, say it means his first characteristic is that of wonder. He's amazing. Remember when Jesus, with his disciples on the Sea of Galilee, and he's, they're in that boat, and that storm comes up in Matthew chapter 8, and the, the men were amazed. That's this idea in different language, Greek versus Hebrew. When Jesus performed miracles, people were amazed, a wonder. To think that he's also, secondly, counselor, authoritative teacher, all-knowing. He's the one we can turn to for help and advice. Who in the world do people turn to? Get out your newspaper. Dear Abby. Is that it? A friend, a neighbor? Can they speak the mind of God? No, we turn to the authoritative one for advice. Think how many marriages could get turned around back on track if they would only be submissive to the word of Christ. How about this one? Stop selfish living in your wife, husband wife wife. Stop being selfish. Boy, if I could only do that, boy, would we have a great marriage. Authoritative counselor. Third, he is mighty God, right? And, and, and attributing deity to the Messiah. Fourth, he's called everlasting father, the eternality of God, the in, eterna, eternality of the Son of God, the Messiah. And he's also called father. This isn't just a description. This is a description of Messiah. And he's called father here. Meaning what? Faithful, tender, guardian, trainer, provider. Fifth, he is the prince of peace. He brings, he is the ruler of peace. He will make peace happen. And see, his work is known, his rule. Look at the beginning of verse 7. His kingdom, the kingdom of the Messiah, at this point, is all future. From Isaiah's viewpoint, it's all future, looking ahead. From the New Testament, we know that his kingdom has come, and it's internal, and it's what Christ has done in us. But that kingdom is yet to come when he will establish life on planet Earth as the promised Messiah. We enter into his kingdom by faith, receiving Jesus, our sins forgiven, and we're born again. And that's where the kingdom starts for us. And then, as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, how are we to live? We're to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's where we have to be living, seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. But his kingdom has not just come. His kingdom is still future. 
when Jesus Christ will come again at the end of this seven-year tribulation period that we see in Scripture, and after the battle of Armageddon, he will establish his kingdom on earth. Isaiah writes all about it. So does Zechariah. So do other writers. This period of, of unending reign of Christ, of peace, there will be no end. Now, from Isaiah's viewpoint, he couldn't distinguish between these two comings of Christ. All he could see is that he was coming. We are living in between the two, and he is going to come again. The Messiah will reign on David's throne, and there will be peace on this earth. We have that peace as we live and live our lives for him, right, in obedience to him. Lastly, we see the second cause of our hope, and it's the zeal of the Lord. Look at the end of verse 7. The cause of his coming, Isaiah writes, is because of his zealousness. Right? The zealous God guarantees this. Literally, it means glowing fire. He's jealous for us. He wants us. We are the object of his love. And he wants us for himself, rightly so. And it's his zealousness that will bring about this purpose and his plan when the Christ comes, the Messiah comes again. God loves us so much, he sent his son to die for us in our sinfulness and lostness so that by faith in him, we can step into this right relationship with God. He loves you that much. We close our time. I want to remind you that we can have hope today for one reason. Because Christ has come. And he brings with him hope. I I hope no matter what struggles and battles at work, in life that you may have, struggles in family relationships, those can tear us apart, can't they? What can be more ripping than than a family that is ripped apart. And our hearts are heavy. But we we got to remember that he brings hope in the midst of all those struggles. For those who have placed their trust and faith in him, hope over despair. Isaiah wrote of the sin of Judah. It wasn't unique to that nation, but it's a part of life. Despair is great when the sinner knows better. (laughs) I know better. You know better. It results in darkness, turmoil. When we live as a follower of Christ and live with hypocrisy in our lives, there's a reason for despair. When we have gone our own way in rebellion, for the unbeliever, there's no way out of that darkness unless they turn to Christ. For the believer, it's turning back to him, getting our sins dealt with again, confessing them to the Lord. That's the way out. Because Jesus will renew that light in your life. And we can walk with him well again. And that's how we need to live. He's liberated us from the death penalty so that we can have life. We've been set free so we can live in his peace. Do you need that peace? Do you need that hope? It's ours. Let's bow for prayer. Heads bowed. Again, I, I want you to reflect back on any struggles that you've been having in your life, in your marriage. What battles have you gone through as a believer? For students, it may be in relationships or studies. It could be our work, our finances. Maybe you're struggling through some major decisions. Can you think of a few? What are you struggling with? Have you felt that there's no way out? Well, there is. As we are determined to live by faith, walk by faith in Christ, in his word, submitting our lives to him, that's what it takes. There's no fear of good news, of bad news to those who trust in the Lord. Jesus has come to bring you light and life and liberty and freedom and peace in every battle you go to. But you and I have to submit our heart to him anew afresh.
We have to turn to His Word and obey His Word. He'll get us through His way, maybe not our way. Would you pray about that? There may be some here this morning or maybe from home watching online that you would say, I've not stepped into that right relationship with God. I've not embraced Jesus as my Savior. It's a choice. It's a decision we have to make to receive Him, John writes in his Gospels, but as many as received Him. Maybe this morning you need to take and receive Him. You can right now. Silently, you can pray from your heart. You can say, Jesus, I understand who you are, the Savior, God in flesh, and you came to this earth to die for my sin. And today I receive you as my Savior. Cleanse me and forgive me. I give my life to you that's your prayer anyone in this room or those from home please please let it and us our staff know that again i want to take another minute for those of us as believers to look in our own hearts you need to know if, if you need to renew your heart your faith in christ i'm not talking about to be saved again but i'm talking about having a freshness in your walk with him because maybe there's some despair that's just pulling you down. If there's sin in your life, take a moment and confess it. Turn from it. If you have doubts and you're struggling, you pray. Tell the Lord to rule in your heart anew. I surrender what? What are you going to surrender to Him anew? Take a moment. We have a moment. I give you myself fully. Will you pray those concepts, those ideas? You pray. the battle we've got to be determined in Christ to hold our ground not give in to fear for Christ is our help he is our strength and we sing the word always he is always that no matter how the battle feels to us he doesn't change we need to draw near to him he always comes through his way let's stand let's sing that together